Hello everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Baji Rao AS Academy. Today is 8th of April and in today's lecture we have few interesting topics that are covered in both the Hindu and the Indian Express newspaper. So we will discuss all those important news articles one by one. So before discussing those news articles, let's try to solve yesterday's lecture practice question. The question was which of the following states is Papikondalu National Park is located. So this was the question I have given you in the previous class. So the correct answer for this question is option C because the Papikondalu National Park is located in the state of Andhra Pradesh. On this image you can clearly see the location of Papikondalu image and other defining feature of Papikondalu National Park it is located on the banks of river Godavari. Please remember river Godavari flows from west to east and it submerges with the Bay of Bengal and Papikondalu National Park is located on the banks of river Godavari. Side by side you can also see the location of other national parks in Andhra Pradesh. They are Rajiv Gandhi National Park and Sri Venkateshwara National Park in the Eastern Ghats or in the Nallamalla Hills of Andhra Pradesh. Now today's practice question is which of the following statements accurately describes crop diversification. Now crop diversification is very important to maintain soil fertility and crop diversification is very often in news or it is also in your syllabus whether it is in your prelim syllabus or in main syllabus also in geography environment and also in agriculture section of the economy so the crop diversification is very often discussed so it is discussed in the context of declining the soil fertility in the agriculture fields so which of the following statements accurately describes the correct uh, statement with respect to the crop diversification so first statement says that crop diversification refers to the practice of cultivating a single crop variety throughout one year or throughout the year second statement crop diversification involves cultivation of multiple crops on a rotating basis within a farming system third statement crop diversification primarily focuses on maximizing the yield of a single cash crop option d says crop diversification is only beneficial for large scale commercial farms so please answer this question in the comment section now here there is a correct definition that is being given for the crop diversification identify the definition and answer the question in the comment section so the correct answer i will be providing you in the next lecture so let's try to discuss few important news articles that are given in the hindu newspaper for today's discussion and first and foremost we need to talk about a very important editorial that was given in the indian express okay so this article was given in the indian express so we all know that india is very often located in it is said that very often it is said that india is located in a complex neighborhood why complex neighborhood because now if you look at sri lanka so china making deeper inroads into sri lanka and posing the uh, you know strategic and security challenge challenges for india and apart from that the kachatibu islands and the regular conflicts with respect to the fishermen secondly the recent regime change in maldives also so that has also resulted in anti india sentiments that are being developed in maldives especially at the political level and even in bangladesh also even though the government in bangladesh is pro india or it maintains friendly relations with india but the opposition parties have been very often talking about the india out campaign india out campaign so this was inspired from maldives india out campaign and the success of their opposition parties and this also result in various other challenges for india now apart from that india also faces uh, some challenges with respect to immigration illegal migration smuggling of cattle drug trafficking human trafficking from bangladesh and we all know that from pakistan and Bangla uh, afghanistan also we are sharing uh, such borders 
so uh, with pakistan we have the problem of cross border terrorism and afghanistan is also instable and uh, you know uh, there's a huge scope for the radicalization and uh, you know uh, further giving philip to the existing terror activities or existing militancy in jammu and kashmir so however uh, on our eastern side there is also another neighbor called myanmar now if you look at myanmar earlier there was a democratically elected government in myanmar but the military junta has overtaken the democratically overthrown the democratically elected government in myanmar now it is taken the total control of the entire myanmar state however the problem is that not even asian countries because myanmar is part of 10 member asian grouping not even asian countries or any other major powers across the world and even india have not been doing enough to uh, find out a plausible credible political solution for myanmar and that is very concerning so in this context the author has been talking about a road to peace in myanmar because we very often see uh, the violence and civil war in myanmar civil war as well as violence in myanmar and that has also further led to the instability of not just myanmar but instability of the entire region in the south asia because of the civil war and violence like situation it has also further fueled illegal immigration into indian side illegal immigration into the indian side because if you look at the india's borders at myanmar they are they are not fenced we can say that they are open borders okay so because of that reason also we have been seeing the illegal immigration into indian side however the immigration mostly takes place in the northeast region and northeast is very well known for ethnic sensitivity or ethnic volatility okay so because of this reason it is a very concerning for us and india also very often says that it upholds democracy and it also respects the democratic values across the world so therefore a responsible neighbor should play a larger role in ensuring peace and stability in myanmar and that is what the author has been discussing now try to understand the context uh, in what context this particular editorial has been given we all know that myanmar has been embroiled in a internal conflict right understand this is an internal conflict internal conflict is because the military has overthrown the democratically elected government and has taken control of the myanmar so that has further led to the internal conflict in myanmar because there was a military coup that took place in february 2021 so myanmar is under the military group from february 2021 so that has resulted in a de facto division between military government and the resistance since because of the military government there has been a large scale violence and violation of human rights of people in myanmar so that has resulted in a resistance movement from the people and the resistance movement has also getting support from the armed militia within myanmar so that has further made the situation you know a volatile and it it looks like peace would not prevail in a very near future so this is the situation in myanmar so the situation has further escalated in recent times and that has posed serious risks to the civilian population and at the same time that this has resulted in a lot of concern from the un secretary general and other experts because this conflict will have a long term implications not just for myanmar but entire region and this will lead to the violation of human rights of the people and at the same time large scale violence has also been taking place in the state of myanmar and that has significantly derailing the education of children the health care of the people and any other basic necessities and necessary services 
so because of that that reason the united nations and other experts have been very concerning about this situation in myanmar and in this context the author has been discussing this particular editorial or he has been given this particular editorial now first try and understand what was the ground reality and what was the human this humanitarian crisis is all about so as i have already told you that when military coup took place so that has resulted in large scale violence within the state of myanmar so against the military coup resistance movement was also started in the state of myanmar and this resistance movement has been getting support from the armed militia of the myanmar in terms of weapons financial support materialistic support every support is provided by the militia to resistance movement and this resistance movement is fighting against the military coup in myanmar and this has resulted in large scale violence and even violation of the human rights and normal people are actually suffering in this conflict so because of that reason we can say that the conflict is escalating in nature right so the expansion of conflict in rakhine state and forcible recruitment of youth into military is a worrying factor here earlier also this rakhine state was in news rakhine state was actually the southwestern part of myanmar where rohingya muslim minorities used to live however in recent times there was a large scale exodus of rohingya muslim minorities took place from the rakhine state of myanmar because of the military crackdown on the rohingya muslim minorities with the pretext of they supporting the terrorist activities so apart from that there is a significant increase in the air strikes by the military and estimated that these air strikes have displaced millions of people and they are in dire humanitarian needs so in order to crack down on the resistance movement in myanmar what the military has been doing the military has been doing the air strikes against different resistance forces resistance groups so that has actually led to the displacement of millions of people from myanmar and now they require a humanitarian assistance humanitarian assistance actually means that safe passage is part of the humanitarian assist assistance they require medicine essential medicine they require refuge and they require food drinking water so all those services comes under the humanitarian assistance since displacement of the people from their original homes require a large humanitarian uh, assistance to those displaced people however there are lot of challenges in providing humanitarian assistance or aid distribution so those challenges are actually because of uh, you know vast humanitarian needs we need to support millions of people who are displaced because of this conflict and apart from that we should also talk about the existing logistical constraints or logistical challenges because if you look at myanmar it very often has a very tough or difficult terrain that you cannot reach easily and you cannot easily provide them the humanitarian aid and at the same time the situation is very volatile on the ground since the situation is a very volatile when military has not providing you the assurances of your safety how can you provide the humanitarian aid to the people and that is a major question and that is also posing significant challenges in providing the humanitarian aid to the people in the state of myanmar and after that we should also talk about the internal stakeholders within myanmar so the internal stakeholders including the resistance forces and they are actually unable to de escalate the existing violence and or facilitating the humanitarian assistance so no group in myanmar is ready to provide the humanitarian assistance for the people and they are also not even ready to de escalate the existing situation to maintain that there will be no violence 
takes place or there will be no violence while providing the humanitarian assistance for the displaced people and because of this reason it necessitates external help from countries like asian association of southeast asian nations china india and bangladesh so these countries have been sharing its borders with myanmar and stability of myanmar is very important for the peace and stability of the entire region so therefore it is the responsibility of these countries to make sure that the situation will not escalate further and these countries should come forward and they must provide the humanitarian assistance for the people in the state of myanmar and that is very important because if you look at india very often builds its soft power on the basis of goodwill that it generates in the minds of the people and if india has not able to india is not able to find out a credible solution a peaceful solution for the existing myanmar issue how can we maintain the goodwill in the minds of the people and that is what is very important and that is what the author has been emphasizing here and apart from that the author is also talking about the need for external assistance and dialogue because internally the matter will not be resolved between different factions and that has further given rise to a large scale violence within myanmar so therefore this necessitates external assistance external assistance from other like minded countries such as india china and asian countries and other superpowers and in fact un everyone should sit together and they should find out a peaceful solution for this myanmar issue and in this context myanmar's friends such as the asian countries and india india is not part of asian remember so a uh, myanmar's friends must must push for an early uh, cessation of the fighting and suggest pathways for nations return to normalcy however in this context the asian nations can play a very important and the larger role and asian neighbors can push the existing myanmar's military regime for the cessation of violence and fighting and uh, come back to the uh, diplomatic table to discuss a better solution for this existing issue however the asian nations efforts like earlier they come up with the five point consensus so the five point consensus actually having a lot of shortcomings and this five point consensus is not addressing the actual issue in myanmar and because of that reason it has fallen short and that has further resulted or underscoring the need for innovative dialogue mechanisms ultimately we need to bring different factions onto the diplomatic table finding out a plausible and more credible peaceful solution and that is how we can address this issue uh, th this is what the author has been suggesting with respect to the myanmar's problem however India is one of most important neighbors for Myanmar. Now in this context it is very important for us to understand what India what is actually the India's role. So that we need to understand India's potential contribution with respect to the Myanmar's crisis is that India is a major neighbor everyone knows about that India shares one of the longest borders with the Myanmar and India also having the open borders with Myanmar. open borders with myanmar right so therefore in this context we can say that we can safely say that india possesses the capacity to provide aid that includes humanitarian aid to the myanmar's resolution process and in fact in order to you know give more credibility to the uh, to the any diplomatic process india can actively lend its support to such diplomatic activity because peace and stability in myanmar would bring peace and stability in india and at the same time in the region south asian and southeast asian region because please remember there are number of projects for example india myanmar thailand trilateral highway so peace and stability is very important to ensure that there will be proper connectivity within the south asia southeast asian region and secondly we should also talk about bimstec 
Myanmar is one of the important members of the BIMSTEC grouping. So therefore, this should also be keep uh, kept in mind. Right. So in fact, India has a policy called Act East policy. So this Act East policy for the success of Act East policy, Myanmar stability is very important. And we also have the Sitwe port. So this Sitwe port is also very crucial, which provides connectivity to India's Northeast. For all these reasons, stability and peace in Myanmar is very, very important for India. In this context, Indian experts should actually develop a practical proposals. So those practical proposals must consider the power dynamics and regional geopolitics in the region. Okay, so what are the different uh, power factors which have been shaping the existing conflict and what are the regional geopolitics which have been lending support to the different factions within Myanmar that we need to understand so that it will be helpful for us to come up with more practical proposal to deal with the existing Myanmar crisis and thereby we can advise the existing policy makers and shape a regional approach that could address the existing crisis in Myanmar. And after that, we should not forget the threat to the regional peace and stability because of the Myanmar instability. Okay, so there may be a uh, Myanmar conflict may spill over into the entire region. Okay, so because of that reason, we can say that it not only affects the internal stability, but it will also pose a significant threat to the regional peace and regional progress also. How regional peace and regional progress? Because I have already told you uh, different reasons why stability and peace in Myanmar is very important. And apart from that, if you look at all the Northeast, it is a very sensitive region for India. A very, very sensitive region. Now, if immigrants continues to coming into Myanmar, uh, coming into the Northeast, so that could also create a lot of issues within Northeast. So not just immigrants problem, but insurgency. Insurgency is one of the most challenging issue that we have been facing. So increasing insurgency in the Northeast would also a threatening or a challenging one for India. So therefore, India's engagement is very crucial and very important. So that could prevent the further ex escalation and ensure stability in its eastern neighborhood. So overall, the author has been suggesting that peace and stability in India's eastern neighborhood is very important and that plays a very crucial role. So however, in this context, we need to look for the pragmatic solutions. So what kind of a pragmatic solutions we can devise? So Indian experts actually play a vital role in crafting the pragmatic, practical and realistic solutions. So that can address Myanmar's complex dynamics. Uh, it should take into account the historical context and the regional implications of any such solution or any such policy. And India's proactive involvement is also emphasized by the author because earlier author has also said that India is able to or India has the ability to help uh, you know, provide more credence to the existing peace process or to bring peace and stability in Myanmar. So therefore, India's proactive involvement can actually mitigate the risk of regional destabilization stemming from Myanmar's prolonged crisis so that it will not threaten the regional stability and regional peace. So the next article that we are going to discuss in this lecture is uh, with respect to, uh, you know, India's public health care. Okay, so that is with respect to India's health care. Now, April 7 is known as the context was April 7 was known as World Health Day. So because of that reason, the author has uh, talked about one important, uh, 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 you know, thing that is inclusive health care, shaping India's path to inclusive health care. So World Health Day is observed annually on April 7 and it focuses on health equity. So please understand health equality is different from health equity. Now when I say health equity, so health equity is actually poor having access to health care, poor having access to health care, access to 
हेल्थ केयर सो दैट इज अ यूनिवर्सल हेल्थ केयर सो दैट विल नॉट इम्पैक्ट द पीपल्स एबिलिटी टू गेट द हेल्थ केयर सर्विसेस फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ यू लुक एट द इंडियन हेल्थ केयर द आउट ऑफ पॉकेट एक्सपेंडिचर ऑन हेल्थ इज अराउंड फोर्टी टू परसेंटेज ऑफ द टोटल इनकम ऑफ हाउस होल्ड्स सो ड्यू टू हायर आउट ऑफ पॉकेट एक्सपेंडिचर जनरली द पुअर पीपल और पीपल बिलो पॉवर्टी लाइन दे डू नॉट सीक द मेडिकल केयर दे इवन डोंट गो फॉर द डायग्नोसिस मेडिकल डायग्नोसिस सो इमेजिन इन द केस ऑफ ट्यूबक्यूलोसिस इफ दे डोंट गो फॉर द ट्यूबक्यूलोसिस इट विल नॉट जस्ट थ्रेटन देयर हेल्थ बट इट विल ऑल्सो थ्रेटन द हेल्थ ऑफ देयर फैमिली मेम्बर्स एंड अदर्स बिकॉज इट इज कॉन्टैजियस इन नेचर contagious in nature and it is chronic in nature without right diagnosis you cannot cure tb in a shorter period of time and it will also impact the income and livelihood security of the individual and the family where the tb is affected so because of that reason health equity is very important and every year April 7 is celebrated as World Health Day to ensure health equity. So this emphasizes on importance in global health and justice. The importance of health equity in global health and justice. So in fact, World Health Organization actually highlights the health as a fundamental human right under the theme called My Health My Right. Okay, so under My Health and My Right, World Health Organization treats this as a fundamental human right now in this context we will try to understand few things with respect to health equity and what exactly its significance so i have explained you what exactly is the health equity so health equity is getting the medical services with the affordability accessibility availability of same quality healthcare services to every citizen of this country without any discrimination okay so defining health equity so first and foremost understand the definition of health equity so health equity ensures the equal opportunity for individuals to achieve their highest health potential and at the same time we will not take into account their circumstances so circumstances in the sense that we will not take into account their economic conditions their social conditions or their political conditions rather without looking into the circumstances of the people whether they are in mi- minority majority whether they are in lower caste or higher caste so we will not take into account any of these distinctions or any of those circumstances rather health equity actually means or it ensures equal opportunity for all individuals to achieve their highest health potential in fact the health equity addresses the social economic environmental factors which have been actually impacting the health outcomes of the people and thereby eliminating the preventable disparities now within uh, the societies and within the communities there are a lot of disparities however the ultimate focus should be on preventing those disparities among the people by providing the health equity and if you can understand health properly health actually has a multiplier effect on the societies and individuals well being also a healthy individual can earn a decent livelihood a healthy individual can actually earn a decent livelihood and in fact a healthy child's learning outcomes a healthy child learning outcomes would be much more higher thereby he can become a successful student in his studies or her studies so therefore health is actually having a multiplier effect and through equity in health care we can eliminate certain preventable disparities within the societies and communities also however in order to ensure the health equity there are certain challenges and the root causes of those challenges we will also try to understand now what will be the major challenges when we talk about ensuring the health equity among the people for example uh, we can very often talk about people who are below poverty line or poverty in general is one of the causes of 
lack of health equity or poor health among the people so after that the discrimination is also one of the reason discrimination uh, in terms of gender discrimination in terms of the caste class of the people and racial discrimination of the people all those factors are also responsible for poor health care services and limited access to education clean drinking water sanitation and health care all of those are considered as major challenges that every society and every community has been facing in india so those challenges must be addressed with immediate attention and immediate priority and that is very important now in fact uh, since 2020 we have seen a dangerous pandemic so that is because of the covid-19 virus so the pandemics and in fact the climate change is also become one of the potential threats that uh, the uh, human beings and the uh, wildlife has been facing and after that the socio political unrest so when i say the socio political unrest for example you, we can say that myanmar issue is a socio political unrest not just myanmar we also have countries like haiti south sudan so they have been facing a lot of socio political unrest and we can also say recent example of uh, israel and palestine conflict Israel and Palestine conflict is also a socio-political unrest. So they have been actually the factors which further increasing the existing disparities among different sections and different communities. And this is more prominent in a country like India. So these disparities have become more prominent in a country like India and this is what the author has been suggesting. So however, if you look at the global efforts with this regard, so in order to ensure the health equity among the people so in fact there are a lot of challenges at the global level and at the national level to ensure health equity so those issues we have discussed earlier briefly for example pandemics posing one of the most critical challenge to ensuring health equity now if you look at the covid-19 pandemic covid-19 pandemic the healthcare infrastructure has faced a lot of stress during the covid-19 pandemic poor people are uh, very often do not have access to you know uh, even the beds and even proper care and after that climate change and conflicts have also uh, posing a, a you know more challenges so therefore in this context there is a requirement or there is a need for collective international action because these pandemics and climate change are not uh, you know a phenomenon that is being observed in one single country rather they are global phenomenon they can be addressed uh, the negative consequences can be observed across the world so therefore one single country cannot address these challenges and in this context we require the collective international action and that is very important and in order to ensure the collective international action world health organization can play one of the most important and prominent role in coordinating collaborating all the stakeholders who are involved in ensuring the health equity for the people so if you look at the covid-19 pandemic it has actually highlighted the disproportionate impact that this pandemic have or had on marginalized groups widening the health equity gap also so covid-19 was an example so what lessons we have learned from the covid-19 pandemic and how we have been applying those lessons to ensure health equity is what is very important for a country like india for a diverse country like india with a lot of disparities however there are lot of challenges in ensuring the health equity and at the same time there are also several global initiatives also in this context which ensures the health equity at different levels so uh, what are the major challenges or permanent challenges that we have been uh, seeing with respect to health equity or ensuring the health equity for example uh, the notable differences in healthcare outcomes and healthcare access especially in rural areas and urban slums now if you look at the rural areas very often people in rural areas they don't seek medical care 
even they require medical attention and medical care they don't seek the medical care so because of poor health care infrastructure poor health care infrastructure in those rural areas and at the same time as i have already told you that the out of pocket health care expenditure is also very high in a country like india right so the incomes are very low for the poor people so since incomes are very poor and healthcare costs are significantly high so because of that reason they very often don't seek the medical care and medical interventions and this is not just the case with the rural poor but also the people who are living in the urban slums are also facing the same problem with respect to seeking the medical care and at the same time there's a huge disparity in providing health care services because if in india 74 percentage of the health care is managed by the private sector alone but on the other hand the problem with the private sector is affordability issues the health care that is being provided by the private health care institutions are not affordable for the common people and at the same time not all people have awareness with respect to the health care insurance so health care insurance is also very important but not all people have access to the health care insurance so all these factors have been uh, you know creating a lot of challenges for us and apart from that there are disparities also across caste gender and economic status and they also contribute to the various health outcomes and they also impacting the health equity that we wanted to achieve in this context however we require a more comprehensive approach in this regard so when i say comprehensive approach so this comprehensive approach would bring or take into account multiple aspects of providing the health care so it would not just look at providing health care rather it would also look at the associated issues for example nutrition would be closely linked with the health care of the people and along with the nutrition sanitation of the people is also closely linked with the health of women sanitation hygiene nutrition so all those factors would be taken into account while we consider the health equity and when we say that in order to ensure health equity through a comprehensive approach so that definitely improves the healthcare in india so that could make healthcare in india more holistic so there are initiatives like ayushman bharat and national health mission that they aim to reduce the disparities among access and strengthening the existing infrastructure now if you look at ayushman bharat it actually provides rupees 5 lakh health insurance to every household right so those programs are actually reducing the disparities within a country like india however in this context we should not forget the role of different stakeholders they can play uh, and their role also for example government civil society healthcare providers communities so they must collaborate to address the socio economic determinants of healthcare now in this context it is very important to develop the health literacy among the people especially in rural areas and in urban areas so not just health literacy but it should also include literacy on uh, awareness on sanitation hygiene and nutrition and we need to undertake the community driven projects or community driven initiatives non governmental organizations involvement with respect to this and international support actually plays a crucial role in achieving the health equity in india so this is how we can ensure health equity for a country like india and this is what the author has been emphasizing upon now let's try to discuss the next very important news article so that is with respect to the semiconductors so these semiconductors are actually very often in use now if you look at india india do not have a strong and robust semiconductor manufacturing base rather we have dependent on countries like us and china for importing these semiconductors in fact these semiconductors actually play a very important role in all the electronics manufacturing all the electronics manufacturing so since these semiconductors will be the future 
and at the same time india is known as a digital india or digital bharat it has been strongly making efforts or inroads into of becoming a digital india in near future and at the same time make these digital gadgets affordable for every individual okay so affordability and at the same time establish india as a strong export hub or manufacturing hub of these manufacturing hub of these semiconductors to the globe and utilize a huge talent pool that we already have in the form of demographic dividend and create large scale employment and also leverage the existing private sector participation and the capacities and technologies for manufacturing the semiconductors so the government has focused on the semiconductor manufacturing program now in this context we will briefly understand what exactly is the semiconductor chip okay so semiconductor this uh, this is actually the semiconductor semiconductor chip manufacturing capabilities are currently very very limited uh, to a few regions in the world for example china taiwan japan and us so very few countries have the ability to produce these semiconductor chips so due to its limited manufacturing base and in case if there is any potential geopolitical conflicts or any other pandemics like covid-19 so that could heavily disrupt the supply chains now imagine for uh, the supply of semiconductors if india dependent on china and tomorrow if there is any issue between india and china and china denied to supply these semiconductors to india now that will significantly impact our existing economy right so that also impacts the manufacturing of electronics so because of that reason the threat of supply chain disruptions india has realized the importance of the semiconductors and now it started investing in the manufacturing infrastructure of semiconductors right so because of that reason india has actually started investing in the semiconductor manufacturing so in this context what exactly is a semiconductor we'll try to understand this also so what exactly is the semiconductor manufacturing now please understand semiconductor is actually a material so that is being used in electrical circuits and other components that partially conduct electricity okay so for example this is a semiconductor and these semiconductor materials very often possess the properties between those of a conductors so they conduct electricity or electric charge so they possess the properties of conductors and at the same time they also used as a insulators because remember these semiconductors conduct uh, this partially okay so partially conducts the electricity so because of that reason we can say that they are uh, you know they possess the properties of conductors such as metals and at the same time the insulators also such as glass or plastic now most commonly used semiconductor material is silicon silicon is most commonly used for the manufacturing of these semiconductors so the conductivity component of semiconductors can be altered by introducing impurities through a process called doping because remember semiconductors actually having the behavior or the properties of both conductor and insulators and if we wanted to uh, reduce the conductivity of these semiconductors we can alter by introducing more and more impurities through a process called doping by adding specific impurities semiconductor's electrical properties can be converted or controlled so that could have a significant and potential applications in the manufacturing of various other electronic devices such as laptops mobile phones and any other electric devices now what are the applications the applications include microprocessors memory chips commodity integrated circuits micro microcontrollers transistors and others so these are the applications of the semiconductors the various applications of the semiconductors now briefly understand how a semiconductor chip is being manufactured okay so the semiconductor chip is manufactured much like a postal stamp now if you look at this semiconductor it looks like a postal stamp okay so therefore in this context 
okay so therefore in this context it it is much like a a postal uh, a postage stamp and a sheet of stamps is printed on a piece of paper and then each individual stamp is cut out similarly an array of typically 300 to 400 chips are printed on a circular piece of semiconductor it is called a wafer in industry parlance okay so you can see here so this is an array of chips various number of chips that are being printed on a, a circular piece okay so that uh, circular piece of semiconductor called vapor now this is then diced to create an individual chips so this is how these chips are actually created in industries now recently the government has launched various initiatives with respect to promoting the semiconductor manufacturing so firstly we need to talk about the semicon india program so this semicon india program was approved by the government in the year 2021 so this program is actually aimed at development and manufacturing of the semiconductors and display of the manufacturing ecosystems over the next six years so rapidly increasing the capacity of manufacturing these semiconductors in the next six years so india semiconductor mission was also launched so this was set up by the digital india corporation to drive different strategies for developing the semiconductors and display ecosystem now please remember if any uh, country wanted to develop the semiconductor uh, manufacturing base so it is very important that it should identify what are the challenges and what is its scope and what is the potential so accordingly the governments will come up with different policies and these policies will actually help further improving are uh, working on the existing drawbacks existing shortcomings and gradually improving the manufacturing capacities so the two assembly and test plants in gujarat and assam have also been recently approved by the government of india so recently the government of india has approved setting up of semiconductor manufacturing plants in gujarat and assam okay so this is with respect to the semiconductor manufacturing now let's try to understand another important news article so that is with respect to right against adverse effects of climate change part of rights to life now uh, if you look at indian constitution uh, right to life is part of article 21 okay right to life is part of article 21 so in recent uh, one of its judgment the supreme court has said that uh, you know right against adverse effects of climate change is actually the part of right to life now the right to life under article 21 is actually considered as a broader right because right to environment comes under this right to environment comes under this and right to marry of one's own choice comes under this so therefore it it is a very broader right now recently supreme court in one of its judgment has said that right against the adverse effects of climate change is a part of right to life and equality so right to equality is mentioned in right to equality is part of article 14 of the indian constitution so therefore we all know that the havoc that the climate change has been creating across the world so how challenging the climate change has become in recent times so therefore in this context it has resulted in adverse effects on people especially the poor communities poor communities have been actually facing the brunt of the climate change not just the pure poor communities but also the wildlife such as the great indian bustard have been facing the adverse effects of climate change so taking inspiration from this the supreme court has interpreted that right against the adverse effects of climate change are actually part of right to life under article 21 and right to equality under article 14 of the indian constitution okay so now let's try to understand the context so this is considered as one of the landmark judgment by the supreme court of india so that actually emphasized on the critical intersection between climate change and human rights see we need to be mindful of climate change because climate change has been adversely affecting the human rights of the people 
so because of that reason this judgment is considered as a landmark judgment and that has created a critical intersection between climate change and human rights in fact this particular judgment has emphasized on the constitutional guarantees of the right to life under article 21 and at the same time the supreme court has also talked about or emphasized on india's need to prioritize clean energy initiatives because clean energy initiatives would help in reducing the negative consequences or negative impacts of climate change so particularly solar power and that could mitigate the adverse effects of climate crisis and this is what the supreme court has said in recent judgment so however please understand the constitutional right to life and health care the supreme court has actually underlined the impact of climate change on the fundamental right to life so there is no doubt that fundamental uh, rights are very important and sacrosanct and at the same time climate change is actually violating the uh, right to life however the anthropogenic factors or a uh, human factors are largely responsible for the climate change the countries are not doing enough to mitigate the negative and adverse effects of the climate change so therefore without a clean and stable environment the right cannot be fully realized and this is what the supreme court's observation and in fact so factors like air pollution we have regularly see air pollution in major cities and rising global temperatures heat waves natural disasters like uh, forest fires floods and droughts so they directly affect the citizens health and well being and that amounts to the violation of the fundamental rights under article 14 and article uh, article 14 and article 21 of the indian constitution okay so the judgment has actually made references to the petition to protect the critically endangered great indian bustard so we have several times discussed about the great indian bustard so because the great indian bustard has been facing the tangible impact of the climate change on uh, you know uh, impact of the climate change so now climate change also having a lot of impact on the wildlife conservation also now this is the bird which is you know facing the threat of extinction because of various reasons particularly the climate change so in this context the court has also emphasized on uh, you know climate change Uh, significantly affecting the indigenous communities and threatening their lands forests and the cultural heritage also so because the climate change is very often creating forest fires landslides forest fires and landslides so they are very often human induced and species extinction species extinction is also another reason which has been disproportionately impacting the local or indigenous communities and in fact the court along with the great indian bustard has also acknowledged the destruction of tribal lands and displacement from their homes and that can actually impact the constitutional guarantee of right to equality and the court has specifically made references with respect to the plight of tribals in the andaman and nicobar islands it has been highlighting their relationship with nature is intertwined with their cultural and their religious practices and the tribals in andaman and nicobar islands have been facing the threat of you know uh, land the forest and the cultural heritage so they also facing the threat of displacement from their original habitat so therefore uh, if you look at some uh, some of india's renewable energy uh, achievements india's goal is to achieve 500 gigawatt of non fossil fuel based electricity generation capacity so this is part of india's overall panchamrut commitments right so this is part of india's panchamrut commitments so however it is being aligned with the uh, you know achieving or becoming net zero by 2070 so india will become net zero by 2070 along with achieving 5 500 gigawatt of non fossil fuel based electricity generation capacity 
so in fact there was a report uh, by renewable energy statistics 2023 so this renewable energy statistics 2023 says that india has the fourth largest installed capacity of renewables in the world so supreme court has made references to the great indian bustard so earlier lectures also we have discussed uh, the power lines are actually leading to the death of these great indian bustard and they are critically endangered animals under international union for conservation of nature and at the same time they are protected under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act okay so uh, that's all in this lecture and uh, thank you so much so please subscribe our youtube channel and also hit the like button so that we can uh, come up with more important uh, initiatives that will really helpful for you in your preparation and thank you